congratulations to uh, to Vicky and her colleagues uh, at the CCPN for being able to pull off this uh, this conference under those uh, rather challenging conditions. Um, I must say I'm not complaining because the travel is the easiest travel I've done in a while to a meeting. Uh, so uh, a pleasure to be here and to be able to join you. And again, congratulations on being able to pull off this meeting despite the, the troubles that we're all facing. Um, I was asked to talk about history. And uh, when I got this invitation, I was reminded of my days as a graduate student working with Ray Freeman. And he sort of said, well, when you know that you're invited to give the after dinner talk and he was talking about a Gordon conference, he says, that's the end of your career if you talked asked to talk about history. So just to make sure that I'm not ready to retire yet, I'll oblige and I'll talk for the first bit, the first 20 minutes or so, about some of the historic uh, development of triple resonance NMR. But then I'll uh, like to, to show you that um, we're alive and doing well, and that there's exciting new work going on, both in protein folding and in applying some of this latest technology to studying the um, protease of the coronavirus, that's the principal drug target right now for fighting uh, COVID-19. Uh, so without further ado, the, um, the principal players uh, that play the role in development in, in our lab of uh, the triple resonance experiments are shown here on the first slide, but they're going to come back in the next couple of slides, so uh, I'm not going to uh, talk about it now. Um, when I was originally hired uh, to come to the NIH in 1983, I think there was excitement in the NMR field because there was the, the work, by, particularly by Kurt Wittrich, Rob Captain, and several others, that showed that NMR spectroscopy might have a future in studying uh, protein structure. And those were the classic publications in the JMB 1983, and that was based on interpreting spectra like this here, a nosy spectrum. And uh, sorry, Christina, this might actually have been swiped off one of your early publications back in, in the late 80s. Uh, I think this is a lysozyme spectrum. Uh, this is a BPTI spectrum. But the idea was that you would print out those spectra on enormous pieces of plotter paper, typically one meter by one meter, putting on a drafting table, an architectural drafting table, or on a light box, and overlay the cozy and the nosy spectrum and then trace your way through it like solving a, a jigsaw puzzle, a very painstaking uh, procedure. And some people were very, very good at it. And I knew that I was never gonna be good at this kind of stuff because I don't have that kind of patience. And when I was hired, sort of like the lab chief at the time, uh, Bill Eaton, still the lab chief 37 years later, he sort of was nudging me to get interested in this stuff. And I said, well, thanks, but no, thanks. I've got more interesting things to do. And one of the interesting things was applying this inverse detection that I'd worked on back as a, as a postdoc in, in Colorado. And what we developed at the time was this HMBC experiment that any organic chemist these days is using for structure determination. And we got this beautiful spectrum on uh, coenzyme B12. We, that's really Mike Summers, who was a postdoc in the group at the time. Fantastic work. And I mean, he was able to assign this whole thing, correct the assignments that were in the literature. And I was all excited because we we're finally able to do something on a molecule that perhaps is of interest to some people at the NIH. So I felt like, hey, I was pulling my weight and uh, making everybody happy. Uh, Eaton, of course, was not so happy because he wasn't interested in in uh, coenzyme B12 or any other kind of small molecules. And I was very fortunate because at that time, I was sharing lab space with Dennis Torsia. And Dennis was really in a different institute, but working in our building because that's where the NMR magnets on campus were located. Now, many of you know Dennis from his 45 years of, of history in the NMR field. It's really fantastic work he's done starting out in solid state NMR, but then later also in liquid state NMR. When I joined uh, the NIH, he was actually working uh, on staphylococcal nuclease and doing this by solid state NMR. And the way he did that was by overexpressing, which was really quite novel at the time, and putting specific carbon-13 or N15 labeled amino acids into his protein. And 
from talking to Dennis, he said, well, you could try to do some solution NMR on it. And I figured, hey, that's perhaps not so bad because then I can do my HMBC experiments. And yes, HMBC works beautifully. This is for a selective uh, threonine labeled sample. And you see the correlations from the H alpha to the C alpha of the carbonyl. Uh, this, the C H alpha to the carbonyl of the, uh, the same residue and to the sequential residue for the three bond coupling. So beautiful, I was all excited. And you can do relay experiments, HMQC relay. You see the methyl group for an alanine correlating with the alpha protons and a lot of excitement, interesting, and but it was all selectively labeled. At the time, uh, looking back, I remember criticism that colleagues were saying, well, yes, you're working and you can do this, all this nice stuff, but it's really very artificial because this is not a natural protein. You're working on an overexpressed, bacterially expressed protein. And that's a bit of a cheating, so to speak. Now, Dennis really deserves credit, not only for giving me the protein, but for convincing me that this wasn't cheating. He said, my colleague, John Gurl at the University of Maryland has told me that every protein 10 years from now will be overexpressed rather than being studied as a natural protein. And I figured, well, if that is true, and I believe Dennis, and he turned out to be correct, then in the future, this isotopic labeling is gonna be playing a big role and we could potentially make this interpretation of those very complex nosy and cozy spectra a lot easier than it, than it was uh, at that time. So we weren't the only ones that were thinking about dispersing spectra in, in three dimensions. Uh, there was the homonuclear work carried out by uh, Marius Klor, Angela Cronenborn, Christian Griesing, and Richard Ernst at the time in Germany, in Munich, and in, in Zurich. And then Bullens, Captain, and friends in the Netherlands had a separate uh, project going. This is actually a spectrum published in 1989 by the, the Captain group, beautiful looking spectrum, uh, a nosy, nosy spectrum, uh, fantastic cross peaks, uh, but very difficult to analyze nevertheless. Uh, to me, it was obvious that we really had to use Dennis's approach, Dennis Torsia's approach, uniformly label the protein and use N15 separation of the nosy spectrum so that instead of this very complex 3D spectrum, a 2D spectrum that we have on the right, this is just the amide region showing the cross peaks to all the side chains, almost in, uninterpretable uh, for a mortal like me, for certainly uh, uninterpretable. But once you separate it in the N15 dimension into 128 slices, then you stand a chance because now the overlap is way less. Now, it wasn't really my uh, doing that made this happen. It was the, the work of uh, two fantastic postdocs at the time in the group, Dominique Marion and Louis Kay. And you see him here carrying, he one of the challenges at the time was not just coming up with the idea of doing 3D, but actually doing it. And you see him here carrying four disks of data each, and it took 12 disks, five megabytes each, to collect the total 3D NMR spectrum. Now, rumor has it, and Dominique denies it, but I think the rumor came from Lewis that I was a little bit of a slave driver in the group at the time, and uh, I expected people to work like seven days a week and at least 12 hours a day. And Dominique was pushing for the idea of 3D NMR because he said, the spectrometer is going to be running for three days and I get a really nice long weekend. Now, he denies it. In any case, it turned out to be incorrect uh, because every six hours we needed to change disks. Because once the disk was full, you had to swap it to restart the acquisition and collect the next disk of data. So we had six hour shifts. And among the three of us, we were able to collect a nice 3 3D NMR spectrum of the type that you just saw in the uh, preceding slide. Now, processing the data, you couldn't do this on this Nikolay spectrometer that you see in the background. Obviously, if this is all the data it can collect, how would it ever process a serious amount of NMR data? So Dominique had come up with a very clever way of uh, processing this data, keeping the data effectively in place and shuffling planes of the 3D spectrum, the 3D data set, I should say, and treating every plane as if it is a point 
So doing your Kulitaki algorithm, and you've got to understand how a Fourier transform works that, and how to do it fast. There's a very fast algorithm that's called the Kulitaki algorithm that shuffles those data points, takes linear combinations of them, keeps on shuffling, leaves the space in, in place. And even with limited disk space and limited computer time, he was able to transform this data set that you saw in the preceding slide in an, in an overnight uh, processing on a Sun data station that had a 400 megabyte disk drive. So this was serious uh, data storage that we had at the time. Actually, we had some spare space left over after this whole thing was processed. And then, of course, it got offloaded on tape. So this is the prehistoric stuff, like even your really old phone would have far more memory and storage space than, than we had at the time on our um, advanced Sun 4 uh, data station. Um, now, first applications of this came in, in a collaboration with Marius Klor and Angela Gronenborn that had just joined the NIH. Um, and this was basically doing exactly what was done previously on the light box, but doing it in three dimensions by dispersing the, um, the uh, what we called at the time homonuclear Hartmann-Hahn, Hohaha spectrum is basically the same as a, a toxi uh, spectrum, dispersing it and then having and comparing it to the nosy spectrum and what can connect the peaks. But instead of having this very dense spectrum, Marius would print it out on 128 pages of Xerox paper, uh, spread it out in the basement of his uh, new house uh, next to the NIH campus, and crawl on hand and feet for about 48 hours through his basement across those pieces of paper, and was actually able to trace out the assignments that you see here, and assign and get NOEs for this interleukin-1 beta protein, about 150 residues. Now, at the time, we wanted to develop this and apply this to Mitsu Ikura's pet protein. He had come, Mitsu had come from Japan, and joined my group to study a protein, uh, Calmodulin, that he'd been working on for his PhD. But it clearly was too challenging for a lot of people. And for him, what he'd done is he'd looked at half Calmodulin. He can cleave it in the middle. I'll come back to it in a, in a minute what it looks like. And if you take half the protein, it only has 74 residues. That's small enough that with 2D NMR, you still stand a chance. And he he done some very nice work. But studying the whole protein was really way beyond what could be done. And we'd hoped to apply that triple that uh, N15 separated experiments to Calmodulin, and it didn't it didn't work. The reason it didn't work was the, because the protein is totally alpha helical. And the J couplings between amide and alpha protons were just too small. Now, talking with Dennis and looking at Kai Kai Nosho's work from the early, uh, early 80s, where he was able to see couplings between nitrogen and carbon in very large proteins, actually immunoglobulins, IgGs, he was able to see carbonyl resonances, sorry, carbonyl resonances that were split by the N15 coupling. So I figured, hey, if you can see J coupling in such a large protein, why not uniformly label the protein and transfer magnetization between one bond backbone atoms through a much more efficient process and just uniformly label the thing, have, have the sensitivity of the proton and observe the carbon and the nitrogen by indirect detection. And that's how we came about for correlating HNCO, HNCA, an experiment that never really became very popular, but turns out to be actually quite powerful, was correlating the H alpha, C alpha to the nitrogen of the next residue, the HCA, CON experiment, and various other ones, and several more incarnations uh, of those triple resonance experiments that, that uh, were developed in, in subsequent years. Now, you might say, hey, this is a, a pretty great and obvious idea. And I think I, I knew at the start this was going to work like a charm because it was obvious this was a trivial idea. And the only thing we needed to do was actually program the pulse sequence, make it happen. Um, now, in retrospect, I was very lucky to be at the NIH at the time because 
when we tried to publish this work, um, and this was in, actually in biochemistry, and we titled the, the, the work, the, the paper, A Novel Approach for Sequential Assignment of Proton, Carbon, and Nitrogen Spectra of Larger Proteins, Heteronuclear Triple Resonance, NMR. And it was outright rejected right off the get go um, by two reviewers who claimed that, well, this is very interesting spin trickery, but we really don't need it because we have our cozy and nosy spectra and that works just fine. And only at the NIH would you have enough money to buy isotopes and do this kind of fancy spin trickery. Um, now that was sort of like half correct and uh, certainly not unfair as a criticism from their perspective. And from my perspective, it made me feel how lucky I was that I was able to develop those experiments because if I, at the, at the NIH, if I would have applied for grant money to develop this and people in the study section would have said exactly the same as the reviewers of the paper after we showed that it actually worked, I never would have gotten the money or the opportunity to develop those kind of technologies. Uh, at the same time, when we were doing this, and before I forget, we weren't the only ones having those ideas. Uh, Gerhard Wagner was working on similar experiments. He was at the University of Michigan at the time. Uh, fortunately for me, he was just in the move to Harvard Medical School. So for about a year, he was on hold. So we were getting a nice head start on him while he was moving his spectrometer and his, his group from uh, Michigan to uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Stephen Fessick, uh, Eric Zuderwick, they also were working on, on very similar kind of technology, but they had a responsibility to, to develop drugs, working at Abbott Labs. So again, for us, having the chance to just do whatever we felt like was really giving us a unique chance to develop this kind of technology without any kind of other responsibilities to, uh, to worry about. Now, it wasn't easy to do. You can have an idea, but there was no spectrometer that would be able to do this kind of thing because even the brand new, oops, let me go back here for a second. Even the brand new uh, spectrometer that, that we got, that actually I should say Dennis Torsia got, an AM, Brooker AM500, only had two channels. Um, you could run proton and carbon-13 or proton and nitrogen, but that was it. So if you wanted to do triple resonance, you've got to be able to pulse on the third channel. Now, we were lucky that we had Rolf Chuden as the electronics engineer in the group. He was a former uh, Varian engineer, very skilled, genius at electronics. And he was the one that built for us those third channels, um, third and fourth channel. We needed to pulse on both the C-alpha and the carbonyl. There was no rapid frequency switching. So we used two separate synthesizers for carbon and for uh, carbon, for C-alpha carbon and for the carbonyls. Some of uh, Dennis Torsia solid state amplifiers, directional couplers to combine the radio frequency, attenuators, um, switches that have a very high level of attenuation, blocking RF signals, bandpass filters on the floor here. So this whole gamish here was required to actually get the RF to run on the third channel. Another problem was with this, this um, running this on the Brooker and uh, running 3D on a Brooker in contrast to uh, doing this on the, the Nikolai. Brooker, when they finished a 2D experiment to do anything else, it would take eight seconds. So if you wanted to increment your third time dimension, it would sit there and crunch for eight seconds to ruin your steady state before you could restart the experiment. So um, working with, with Rolf, we came up with what I think was a genius idea, is we basically would stop the clock from ticking on the pulse programmer of the Brooker console. So he would build his own timer that would interrupt the clock of the Brooker, the pulse programmer, for an incrementable amount of time so Brooker didn't know that it was recording a 3D experiment and it would just occasionally send out a clock pulse that would tell Dennis's timer, increment the time that I'm gonna interrupt the thing. So 
a lot of hardware development. And that was the way that we actually were able to, to do this. And without Rolf, this never would have worked. Um, doing this with the triple resonance experiments, then Michu was very rapidly able to assign the whole protein, looked at the NOE spectrum and says, yes, it looks exactly like the X-ray structure uh, for those helical domains. This blue and the red domain is what he studied back as a PhD student. And he says, yes, my NOEs look exactly like they do in the X-ray structure, exactly like in the individual domains, except here in the middle, he didn't see the helical NOEs and he actually didn't see, see alpha secondary chemical shifts that point to helix. So it clearly looked like this helix was not existing in solution, whereas in the crystal structure, it shows this beautiful, very long, central 27 residue straight helix. Now, subsequently, of course, we, uh, we is really uh, Mitsu together with Nino Barbado, who joined the group as a postdoc, studied this by um, uh, N15 relaxation, and were able to show that those domains tumble more or less independently from one another, as if connected by a flexible linker, all right? So there is a little bit of diffusion anisotropy left, but really way less than there was for the individual domains because of this very high flexibility of this linker. Now that turned out to be structurally relevant. And as many of you may have seen, it's showed up in, in several textbooks. This is the first, what I could sort of say, a biologically striking NMR structure where we were able to solve one of the, the big questions that had been asked uh, in the, the biological community, the biochemical community, how does calmodulin, is a regulating enzyme, a regulating a regulatory protein, how does it modulate the activity of over 200 different target enzymes that all have different sequences? It turns out that the target enzyme, in this case, it's a fragment of myosylitin kinase, has a helical structure that was known to bind to calmodulin. And what Mitsu and friends did in collaboration with Marius Klor and Angela Gronenborn at the time is collect the NOEs and assign this whole thing in the bound state with this peptide bound in between. And what you can see is that the two halves of calmodulin have come together grasping onto this helical fragment of the target enzyme, like two hands grasping onto a rope, all right? Sequestering it away from the lysine kinase enzyme, the myosin lysine kinase, and thereby uh, modulating its activity. Uh, subsequently, different X-ray structures, many X-ray structures were solved, NMR structures as well, and they show different orientations of those helices, of those hands, relative to the fragment. So X-rays differ from different X-rays, NMR differs from various X-rays. And that basically points to the fact that there is still additional flexibility within those domains. And indeed, Mitsu had never really studied, uh, never really finished uh, the structure determination because he said, hey, those NOEs look exactly like they did when I, when I was uh, uh, doing my PhD. So he sort of uh, let it alone for a while. And I'll come back to, in, 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 a, in a few slides, what happens actually if you study the individual domains with slightly more sophisticated technology. Now, this technology that we had at the time was good for proteins up to about 10, 12 nanoseconds. You go much beyond that, Lines tend to get broad, so uh, 20 nanoseconds, you get something really large. This really doesn't work so well anymore. Um, signal to noise goes down, amide protons get broad. Uh, Stefan Zeziak had joined us as a postdoc, uh, first initially intended for just a year. He was working on interferon gamma for Hoffman Roche at the time. And he was there at the same time as Jacob Englister was there. Now, Stefan spent a lot of time, and many of you, of course, know him. He's a big professor at the Biocentrum in Basel. Uh, when Stefan joined the group, he was an amazing guy. He had never done NMR before, but he picked it up very, very quickly. And uh, within, within a matter of months, he started improving the experiments that we had at the time, making more applicable to larger proteins. 
taken care that they were optimized in terms of the relaxation processes. But one key development he also made was to realize that relaxation of your carbons is dominated by carbon proton dipolar interaction. And the alpha carbons in particular and the beta carbons are just very broad because this dipolar interaction is large. So he said, well, if he could just fully deuterate all the aliphatic sites, resonances should get narrower, provided we can decouple, deuterium decouple the, the deuterons. And yes, he was able to do this. As you can see here, if you compare the chemical shifts, this is now we're looking at calcium urine B. It's a large protein, they're very large, nasty looking line with it required uh, detergent to keep it in solution. Um, and what we're looking at here is um, C alpha carbons that show splittings to the C beta carbons. In this case, it is with a protonated protein. If you deuterate a protein, you see how much better the resolution gets. You're not trying to decouple the C beta carbon here, just showing the difference in resolution and in signal to noise by doing this. And actually, Stefan was able to do a very clever, sophisticated experiment. And it's surprising that not more people are doing that these days because what Stefan decided to do to make his life easy was to just run magnetization from one amide through the C alpha to the next amide using the carbon, the C alpha to nitrogen coupling. Because he said C alpha now is narrow, has long relaxation properties. So I can use the one bond and the two bond nitrogen carbon coupling to transfer magnetization from one amide to the next amide. So this is the phenylalanine 72. Now this turns out to already be a four dimensional NMR spectrum a cross section through a 4D spectrum where you can connect the amide of phenyl, uh, F72 to lysine 73. You still see a little auto peak. And from 73, you go to 74, and then you go to the amide cross section in the four dimensional spectrum. Now we're talking here 1993, all right? So we've already expanded here to 4D NMR and going from one amide to the next amide to just hop along the backbone like indeed people now do on, on uh, uh, intrinsically IDP, intrinsically disordered proteins. And if you work on deuterated proteins, this triple resonance really is applicable, this kind of, of uh, technology, up to correlations times on the order of about 20 nanoseconds quite readily. Uh, so that makes life a lot easier. Like I said, this is 4D. I ran uh, a step ahead of myself. Um, 4D was developed uh, a year earlier uh, by us, demonstrated uh, actually in parallel um, to, to others, but actually we were the first ones to, to get this to get this out. Separating the 3D nosy spectrum where we had those slices, remember we got a slice for all the sidechain carbons coupled to a given amide but you don't know which side chain proton it is until you separate it in a fourth dimension by the carbon 13 of the attached aliphatic carbon, all right? So we were able to separate this out, this 3D spectrum in 4D spectra uh, back in 1992. Again, uh, work uh, by, by Louis Kay, who took Dominique Marion's algorithm and used the same trick to do the Kulitaki transform, Fourier transform in the third dimension. Now, admittedly, because at the time the, the, the problem was still rather severe in terms of data storage. Um, in practice, the sampling, you could go for about five milliseconds with four scans per, per FID. That was the minimum for the phase cycling. So the resolution that you were getting was typically limited to a couple of hundred hertz because the acquisition time in the nitrogen and carbonyl dimension was limited to about five milliseconds. Now, of course, these days that has changed. These days we have uh, non-uniform sampling. And you heard uh, Isa, uh, uh, Isabella Felli talk about that just uh, an hour ago. Um, that non-uniform sampling has really had dramatic impact. Ernest Lowy already sort of like proposed this back in the 1980s, but uh, with the development of four-dimensional NMR, this became way more important um, now we can get with NUS sampling, you can get fantastic resolution. Uh, this is an application from just a couple of years ago where um, 
uh, Jung Ho Lee, a Korean postdoc, was trying to measure couplings, ecosy couplings between, say, the H alpha and the carbonyl to look at by ecosy to look at couplings like like this to get three bond. Uh, J couplings, two bond and three bond J couplings to get dihedral angle information. Now, to do this, you want to do this by ecosy and you want to do it on synuclein, you need to get very, very good resolution. So, he got line widths that were a couple of hertz in a 4D spectrum, but it requires 200 gigabytes of data storage. And at the time, it was difficult to do with any of the standard packages that had been developed by others. But I was very lucky that I had a very talented guy in the group, still in the group, still very talented, Jin Fa Ying, who came up with a, a, uh, a rather trivial, conceptually rather trivial uh, algorithm that works incredibly well. And some of you may be aware of this NUSCON competition that's being held at the ENC every year. And Jin Fa's algorithm really outperforms uh, many of the other programs in terms of uh, how well it it, uh, read, it it does in terms of uh, faithful reconstruction of sparsely sampled uh, data sets. So he's won first prize with his SMILE program. So this, this program really works. Uh, I'm not gonna explain you how it works, but we can actually rapidly transform rapidly. That means overnight, if you're working on two or 300 gigabytes, but in a matter of, of an hour or two, if, if it's uh, 100 gigabytes, or if it's, so like, sorry, I should say, not, not exaggerate here, 30 or 40 gigabytes for a 3D spectrum. So this has become very practical and has become uh, imminently uh, useful. And I'll come back to that in, in a few minutes. Um, now, another development at the same time, or uh, uh, I should say a couple of years uh, after we did this 3D um, deuteration, triple resonance with, with Stefan, uh, Nico Chandra joined the group and he was able to sort of achieve what I consider the holy grail that we've been struggling with for many years. That is to measure residual dipolar couplings. Now, those were not new at the time. Residual dipolar couplings have been around for, for many, many decades. Actually, 1963, it was when Salpi and Engler showed that if you take a small organic molecule like benzene, or in this case, ethyl benzene, you uh, dissolve it in a liquid crystalline solvent, you put it in a magnetic field, every proton shows a residual dipolar coupling to every other proton in the molecule, giving this beautiful spectrum that's incredibly complex, all right? Because the alignment of this molecule causes the tumbling or the orientation of the molecule to no longer be isotropic, there's a preferred orientation relative to the magnetic field because the liquid crystal is ordered relative to the magnetic field. Now, this would have been pretty useless applying this to a protein unless we can scale down the couplings by three orders of magnitude to scale down a 20 kilohertz proton nitrogen coupling down to 20 hertz or so, or a 40 kilohertz proton carbon coupling down to 40 hertz. And the way to do that, the first way that, that worked for us was to work with a pneumatic liquid crystalline suspension of what we call bicells, all right? Those are Swiss cheese uh, lipid bilayers that spontaneously orient in the, the magnetic field. Jim Prestigard had done beautiful solid state NMR work on it or looking at carbohydrates attached to those bilayers. We knew that they had to orient. And we knew that if you have a water-soluble protein that floats through this soup, it should become aligned, and yes, it did. And we can measure RDCs, as many of you have seen for many years now and are using in your protein structure determination. Now, those are useful, those RDCs, and they're useful for various different purposes, as I'll show you in a few minutes. Um, one application is to go back to this work that, that Mitsui Kura carried out when we said that this calmodulin in the APO state without the target was basically the same as what it was in the X-ray structure. Turned out not to be quite correct. For the C-terminal domain, the RDCs that we measured, not just proteinitis in RDCs, but carbon protein RDCs, nitrogen carbonyl RDCs, a whole bunch of RDCs, they all agreed fairly well 
with the one angstrom X-ray structure that was available for the C-terminal domain of the protein. For the N-terminal domain, the agreement was particularly worse, considerably worse, and only if we reorient those helices relative to the N-terminal to this pair here, so we got a pair of helices here and this pair here, we move them like rigid bodies to the red orientations, about a 20 degree reorientation, then all of a sudden we get perfect agreement with our X-ray structure. And otherwise we don't, as you can see. So just measuring IDCs allows us to refine an X-ray structure or monitor allosteric effects where we see one domain move relative to another domain, like a rigid body, these two helices relative to these two helices. So if we trigger something by binding something remote somewhere else in a protein, you might wonder, is there an allosteric mechanism? Is there any change that is not just strictly local? And those IDCs are extremely good and extremely sensitive for picking that up. And I'll come back to that in, in a little while again, applying this to the um, uh, coronavirus protease. So uh, with this work in hand, and I realize I'm, I'm um, running uh, slower than I was hoping to, but there's some exciting work that I nevertheless want to throw in here, is trying to study protein folding by NMR spectroscopy using triple resonance. And what we're using here is the, the well-known fact that many proteins can be unfolded if you put them under a high degree and a high uh, amount of hydrostatic pressure. So what you've got is an NMR sample tube, a normal NMR sample tube that is connected through a stainless steel tube to a reservoir. The reservoir is this tube here that is pumped up to about two and a half kilobar of pressure. All right. It's connected through a valve, the high pressure valve, we call it. And when we open this valve, the fluid, oil, mineral oil, will flow through here and equalize the pressure with the NMR sample cell. So this thing will become at two and a half kilobar. We close this valve, we open another valve, and as soon as you open this, of course, the pressure releases because the oil can escape. It goes back to a recycling bottle, gets pumped through a pump back into this reservoir. Now, trivial idea, the hard thing is to actually make it work, all right? Um, I was very lucky again to be at the NIH and have a colleague, a very bright colleague, Phil Anfenrup, who helped us and, and built this for us. And I, I told him it really is impossible to do this. Many people have tried it. Uh, he said, no, I can do this. He was working uh, as an X-ray crystallographer, doing fast time-resolved stuff. And he says, I can build this for you in a matter of weeks. This is trivial. So he designed it. And well, it took more than a couple of weeks, but less than a couple of months before he actually was able to get this thing into our magnet, as you can see here on the right. So this whole grand tree is on a pneumatic post that can be lifted up and we can do experiments on proteins under high hydrostatic pressure. And here you see actually a, a close up. This is one of the high pressure valves or the low pressure valve, I should say. This is the return reservoir because when you compress hydrostatic uh, compressed uh, mineral oil, it, it uh, reduces in volume by about 15%, which means when you open this valve, it decompresses and the oil will come flying out of your NMR tube through this, through this stainless steel tubing, going back into the recycling reservoir. So um, you can see this happen. And I play this little video clip. And each time you see it shooting, into the reservoir over here. In practice, we cannot repeat this faster than about once every eight seconds or so, because the oil... <laughs> this was Phil here. The oil travels at the, uh, the speed of sound, so it, it heats up uh, quite quickly. Now, having this technology in hand, and having non-uniform sampling and having triple resonance probes, and now using cryoprobes for this, this kind of uh, pressure cycling experiments, we can do experiments that, are, that go as follows. We drop the pressure, the protein is unfolded, we do the inept transfer still at high pressure, it's very efficient. Now we monitor the unfolded protein just after the pressure has dropped. It's still unfolded, 
it's trying to fold, but it's still a random coil, right? Or we don't know what it is. It's it's trying to fold. What is the structure? We can measure the N15 chemical shift by having an N15 evolution here at one bar while the protein is trying to fold. Or the carbonyl or the C-alpha carbon um, evolution at this time, or the amide proton evolution. We store the magnetization back along the z-axis. We wait for a couple of hundred milliseconds for the protein to fold. And then in the T2 and the T3 dimension, we read out an HSQC spectrum. And you get the triple resonance carbon, nitrogen, proton spectrum, or in this case, a nitrogen, nitrogen, proton spectrum. But along one axis, you see the N15 chemical shift in the unfolded state. And in the other dimension, you see the folded N15 chemical shift. This is the projection of the 3D on the N15, N15 plane. And again, this would never work without having this NUS uh, algorithm to efficiently process the data because you can only collect a few thousand FIDs before this thing starts leaking or develop some other kind of problem. Plus, like I said, it, you can only cycle it with a D1, an interscan delay of about eight seconds at best. But what you can see is large chemical shift changes, differences between the folded and the unfolded state. We can measure those chemical shifts and we can try from those chemical shifts to get some information about what's going on in the protein. Now, um, you might say, hey, it's unfolded here. And obviously it's unfolded because right after the pressure drop, there is no time for the protein to fold. So whatever magnetization evolves at this point has to be unfolded protein. Now, if this protein, this pulse here, this nitrogen pulse were delayed, if we were to wait for 50 milliseconds, the protein may not be fully folded yet. Perhaps it's partially folded. So we might be able to probe what's happening a little bit later. Is there perhaps a stable intermediate in the folding process? And an indication that there was such an intermediate came from just looking at this, the one-dimensional proton spectrum. There's an upfield shifted methyl group at minus 0.3 ppm. And if you look as a function of time after dropping the pressure, see that three milliseconds after dropping the pressure, there's basically nothing. But 25 milliseconds after dropping the pressure, there are two methyl groups. One of them keeps on getting bigger and the other one goes away. This here, the left one, points to a transient metastable intermediate state. And indeed, you can plot the intensity. And you can see here that this intensity of this methyl group goes up and then it goes back down. And what you can see in the 2D nosy spectrum, this is just a regular two-dimensional proton proton nosy we drop the pressure 50 milliseconds before T1 evolution. So at this point in time, we have a population of partially folded protein with this metastable intermediate. And indeed, in the indirect T1 dimension, we see that second little brother of the methyl group in direct exchange with the folded state and in exchange with the unfolded state, all right? So we have two pathways. We go from the unfolded state directly to the folded state. And there is an indirect pathway where we go through the intermediate state that's actually slightly more efficient. And then it goes from the intermediate to the folded state at a relatively high rate of about 70 per second. Now, what is this structure, of course, that would be interesting to know? What is this transient metastable in on pathway intermediate protein structure? And um, it's this guy here, Joseph Courtney, who had joined the group, who actually took this on a very challenging project, not only to measure the chemical shifts of this transient intermediate, that only had a lifetime of, like I said, at most uh, uh, on the order of 30, 40 milliseconds, it lived short, but it never gets very highly populated. So he nevertheless was able to measure NOEs for this thing for this transient intermediate. And what you can see here is the population, those three, the black, the blue, and the red curve, show you what happens after you drop the pressure. The green here is the, the pressure drop. As soon as we drop the pressure, we get the red population of the intermediate, we get the blue population of the folded state, and we get the decay, the disappearance of the unfolded state. Now, this is the nosy mixing period. 
So NOEs will build up for only a very small fraction of the protein during this time, right? It never gets highly populated. It's the integral of this red curve versus the integral of the blue curve. So the NOEs that he's going to observe after he reads it out in the 3D spectrum are going to be weak. But those additional NOEs he can see here are all marked in red. Those red NOEs are incompatible with the secondary structure of ubiquitin. All right? And the only differences he sees pertain to the C-terminal beta strand, beta 5. And only if he changes the register of those beta strands by two residues, can he satisfy the NOEs that he's able to measure in this three-dimensional NOE spectrum and satisfies the NMR chemical shifts at the same time. If you look at the chemical shift changes that he saw, there just let's focus on the C-alpha only for the time being. Um, the chemical shift changes are only for this loop region that pre precedes the C-terminal beta strand and for the C-terminal beta strand itself, going into the disordered C-terminal residues that are seen in native ubiquitin. So this was an indication already that, yes, we do have a significant structural change. He could feed those chemical shifts to chemical shift rosetta, and lo and behold, even while I first looked at this, I laughed. I said, this is exactly ubiquitin. He says, no, it isn't. It comes out two residues out of register. And C.S. Rosetta was able to pick this up just from the chemical shifts alone. But adding the NOEs to it, he was able to reduce the, uh, the backbone distribution of his bundle down to 0.78 of an angstrom. He was able to measure residual dipolar couplings on this uh, sample, a very, very challenging kind of thing to do uh, using Archie spectroscopy, um, also applicable to large proteins. He was able to get very nice RDCs on this, um, this data set on, on this protein and show that actually the structure that he got, the strand shifted, retracted strand uh, structure, um, wasn't actually novel. It was in the, in, actually in the PDB as a strand retracted uh, structure solved by X-ray crystallography by uh, the commander group in, at Cambridge University that in complex with uh, PINK1 that's involved in Parkinson's disease, it, and when the protein gets phosphorylated, this other retracted strand gets populated. We see that it gets populated while the protein is folding itself in its uh, native sequence without any phosphorylation whatsoever. Now, this work, while it was in progress or being completed, uh, COVID-19 arrived on our doorsteps and I was sort of worried, this is the end of NMR for the next couple of months. Um, a very bright postdoc in the group had the foresight to sort of say, hey, if they're gonna shut us down, I need to find uh, myself quickly a COVID uh, protein so that we can keep on doing NMR. And this bright guy was Angus Robertson, or is Angus Robertson, still working on this, this system. And he picked this uh, COVID protease, the main protease. I suggested, why don't you pick something easier? Now he said, this is interesting. It's a dimer. Pressure should be able to uh, denature this thing or dissociate the dimer. Turns out he got lucky. It gives beautiful NMR trozy spectra, provided you fully proliterate the protein. So he was getting able to get those nice spectra. Working with uh, Jin Fa Ying, they were able to do a regular triple resonance on this deuterated protein. This is an HNCACO. They had HNCA spectra. And you can do your regular standard triple resonance assignment. Now, I haven't been doing this myself for a while, so I sort of said, hey, I use one of the standard programs. Uh, they ended up using two automated assignment programs that came up with very different answers. And I was a little bit worried at that stage. Uh, how, how do we know whether it's correct? And one way to see whether it's correct was to just measure RDCs. And the assignments where the two programs agreed actually had very nice agreement with the RDCs. But there were many outliers where the programs disagreed and neither of the two programs uh, agreed with the RDC. So it turned out that even with the 
uh, automated assignment procedures, we still needed to jump back in. And that's what um, uh, Angus is working on as we speak, unless he's wasting his time listening it and looking at my slides here. Um, still trying to put the last dozen or so assignments and links in place manually using the CCPN uh, software. This turns out to be very, very useful for this purpose. Uh, so I'm, I'm very indebted to the, the effort uh, at the UK that is uh, extremely useful to the entire world, I think. Um, and for us, uh, an example of applying 4D trozy nosy trozy spectra, uh, very large data set here, 300 uh, gigabytes of storage. Again, working with GINFA, you see long range NOEs between AMIs, the arginine 76 AMI to uh, aspartate 92, 393. And this is an example of the very high resolution kind of cross sections that one can get. This uh, tells me that I should hurry up a little bit. Um, the very nice NMR spectra that one can get on those, those very large uh, proteins. Um, and then study it by seeing how potential uh, drugs interact. So I um, want to thank a very large group of people that I've had the pleasure of working with over the, uh, the past uh, 40 years. Uh, many of them shown here in the picture. I see Louis K here, Nico Chandra, Bill Eaton. Uh, the, the short guy here is Geertun Wooster, who was at my birthday party, uh, Stefan Zeziak and many others. So with this, uh, thanks for your interest and for your patience, because I see that there's still more than the two people that I predicted that would be online. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and listen to any questions if you have any. Thanks very much.